Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, my name is Olivia Haynes, and I am the director of the Sanford C. Bernstein and Company Center for Leadership and Ethics here at Columbia Business School. And it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you all tonight for our Botlinic Prize in Business Ethics, honoring Miss Rose Macario, the CEO and president of Patagonia Incorporated. Not only will we be honoring Rose tonight with the prize, but we will also be having her sit down with Bernstein faculty <laughs> leader and esteemed CSR scholar, Professor Vanessa Burbano, for what promises to be a very inspiring conversation. But now, please join me in welcoming our senior vice dean, Kent Daniel, for welcome remarks on behalf of the dean's office. Um, welcome, everybody. It's great to see such a big crowd here. Um, so I wanted, um, probably, as you've guessed, the reason I'm up here is because Costis is traveling. He's on a plane heading to Florida right now. But um, I know he is a big fan of Roses and of Patagonia and asked me to thank you all for being here and um, welcome you all on behalf of uh, the dean's office here at Columbia Business School. Um, I'd like to also extend a, a special warm welcome to the members of the Butwinick Wolfenson family. Um, and your dedication, commitment to the school is uh, very much appreciated. Um, the, I also wanted to acknowledge some students who are here with us tonight who are recipients of the Benjamin Butwinick Scholarship. So um, the, as you're aware, um, this generous scholarship is given to all of those or to those who show a very high level of academic and ethical content. So um, uh, it's really an honor and a privilege for me to be here to congratulate uh, Rose uh, Marcario on receiving the prestigious Botwinick Prize um, in Business Ethics. For more than 30 years, the prize has celebrated CBS's commitment to honoring productive, moral, and caring business leadership at work. Rose is joining an amazing community of past winners whose distinguished careers leading purposeful and value-driven organizations continue to inspire MBA students and experienced practitioners alike. Patagonia is an amazing and exemplary company, and Rose Marcario is an amazing leader of this amazing firm. Um, just a few little things here. Since 1985, Patagonia has pledged 1% of sales to grassroots environmental groups, and this has resulted in close to $100 million going towards the preservation and restoration of the natural environment. They've worked hard to make sure that their products are manufactured in a sustainable way, and Ms. Marcario has personally pushed the entire outdoors industry to support maintenance of public lands and to do better on the dimensions of sustainability and climate change. What I wanted to do now is to acknowledge someone who can't be here with us tonight, um, Catherine Phillips. So as probably a lot of you are aware, Catherine was the Ruben Mark Professor of Organizational Character and the Faculty Director of the Bernstein Center. As some of you know, uh, Kathy was bravely battling a second occurrence of breast cancer late last year until her symptoms progressed this past January. Um, Kathy's mission in life was to teach her students how to lead with their values, to give a voice to everyone, and to find business solutions that make the world a better place. We all miss Kathy's laughter, her warmth, her exuberance, um, but we know she's looking down on us now with great pride tonight. Her spirit will continue to guide the important work of the Bernstein Center and this award is an homage to Kathy's mission, highlighting a true maverick who's leading meaningful change through business. So with that, I want to extend a special thank you to those members of the Bernstein Center whose work in leadership and ethics is not only a keystone of a Columbia, Columbia Business School education, but whose impact extends well beyond the classroom by instilling students, alumni, 
and the greater CVS community with the values and integrity needed to be a true, ethical, global business leaders. Again, thanks to everyone for coming tonight, and I would like to warmly congratulate Rose Marcario on this significant achievement. Thank you. And if you can't tell, Senior Vice Dean Daniel has traded in his normal blazer for the Patagonia <laughs> <laughs> gear tonight, so thank you. Um, so I just wanted to echo uh, Senior Vice Dean Daniel's um, kind words on behalf of our faculty director, Kathy Phillips. Um, Kathy truly cared so much about her students, her fellow faculty, staff, as well as friends and family. Um, we miss her every day, but we will continue to emulate her actions and propel her mission forward through the work of our center and through this Botwinick Prize. And so since 1989, Columbia Business School has awarded the Klotmanic Prize in Business Ethics and Ethical Practice in the Professions to an individual or representative of a business organization exemplifying the highest standard of professional and ethical conduct, as well as ethical decision making and leadership. We wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all the former recipients of the Botwinick Prize who collectively represent an exemplary community of ethical leaders. Looking at this list, you will see the names of some of the most preeminent trailblazers in business, people who always led with their values and stood up for what they th believed in, all while delivering purpose and profits to their firms. In 2014, we awarded the prize to David Stern, Commissioner Emeritus of the MBA. David unfortunately passed away on January 1st of this year. However, we wanted to remember him as a leader who grew the NBA into a successful, diversified, premier professional sports league, which made major societal contributions. And we are honored to call him a past Botwinick Prize winner. These fellow honorees serve as a tremendous testament to the power of moral and conscientious leadership. And we are so excited to add Rosa's name to this list. However, none of this would be possible without the generous support of our proud benefactors of the prize, the Botwinick Wolfeson family. The prize was established by Mr. Benjamin Botwinick, a 1926 graduate of the school, along with his wife, Bessie. After graduation, Mr. Botwinick went on to become a well-respected CPA at the Benjamin Botwinick and Company firm, and in 1957, him and his wife established the Botwinick Wolfeson Foundation Incorporated. Though Mr. and Mrs. Botwinick are no, longer, are no longer with us, the Bernstein Center is lucky to have the unwavering support of their two children and spouses, Edward Botwinick and Vicki Brown, and Elaine and James Wolfenson, as well as their children. So please join me in a warm round of applause and appreciation for the Botwinick Wolfenson family. Thank you. This year's nominating committee, which includes the Botwinick family, students, faculty, alumni, and the dean's office, unanimous, unanimously agreed that Rose's lifelong pursuit of and commitment to ethical leadership made her eminently worthy of this prize. Rose has been lauded for being the ultimate mindful leader of one of the world's most successful socially minded companies. Under her leadership as CEO and COO since 2008, Patagonia's profits and revenues have quadrupled, all while taking founder Yvonne Chouinard's radical revolution to scale, driving a hard environmental philosophy beyond company limits. Rose's tagline is, take risks, have courage, and let's make a better world together. And she has certainly delivered on this tagline through her work at Patagonia which includes revising the company's production and sourcing processes to be more environmentally friendly, creating the company's first in-house venture fund, and overseeing the development and creation of Patagonia Provisions, an organic regenerative food company focused on applying Patagonia's mission to the food supply chain. All these, all these accomplishments with one common goal in mind, to use business to inspire and implement solutions to environmental challenges, something she thinks more companies can practice worldwide. And for her efforts, Rose has been honored by numerous organizations for her visionary leadership. Some accolades include being named one of the most creative and innovative CEOs of 2016 by Fast Company, 
headlining Fortune Magazine's Most Powerful Woman in Business 2015, and being named a champion of change at the White House by President Barack Obama. All this to say that Rose exemplifies a proactive approach to leadership and ethics, one that promotes a clear understanding of the importance of giving voice and energy to shared social values that can promote personal and economic thriving for all. So now it's my honor to invite back up Senior Vice Dean Daniel uh, to help me co-present the Botlinic Prize to Ms. Rose Macario. <laughs> Thank you. And we're going to take a picture with Leslie. <laughs> okay. And, uh, so. yes. Okay. Should I? Yeah. Yep. I can be. <laughs> yes, there we go. That makes more. <laughs> Me? <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now the main event. Uh, without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our moderator for the evening, Professor Vanessa Burbano. Professor Burbano teaches management in the strategy area at Columbia Business School. She is especially interested in the strategic implications of socially responsible and irresponsible firm practices and how they influence employee behavior. Her research, which has been featured in Forbes, Fortune, and the New York Times, has been recognized with numerous awards, including those from the Strategic Management Society and the Alliance for Research on Corporate Sustainability. Thank you for being here tonight with us. And with that, when with that I'll turn the floor over to you. Excellent. So Rose, we're so excited to have you. Uh, we asked students to send in questions. We received a huge number of questions. There was a lot of excitement in sort of getting to pick your brains and um, hear more about your experience. So I've selected a few of them, um, and then we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience. So you will all have the chance to ask Rose some questions directly. Great, well thank you. Thank you for coming out and listening to the talk, and it's great to be here at Columbia. So to, to get us started, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how Patagonia, Patagonia views purpose as how is sort of part of how it functions on a day-to-day -day basis and how you can maintain that as you grow and scale your company. Well, there's really not much difference between um, the values of the company and what we do in a commercial sense in the company. So um, there's, there's not really a disconnect. In fact, I think it's really a false choice to say you can either make money or do good. I think you can do good and make money. And the company has been a proof, proof positive of that, I think. Um, so our purpose is really to save our home planet. You know, we're in an existential crisis with climate change. And um, if we don't save the planet, then we won't have a business. You know, it's, it's like what David Brower said, you know, there's no business to be done on a dead planet. And um, we won't have customers and we won't have employees and we won't have resources and uh, and so it behooves all of us to work towards finding solutions to the cli climate crisis and to the environmental crisis that we're faced with. Mm -hmm. And so to implementing some of these things, you, you have to incur sort of costs in the short term. Um, there's a question about sort of how, how do you think about a framework for understanding what sort of the potential short term costs are for doing some of the mm -hmm. things that you've described, but which as you've described have these other types of benefits. Yeah. Well, we use, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the process we use to, to pick suppliers. We use what we call a fourfold process. So our sourcing people, our quality people, our environmental um, uh, uh, group, our social responsibility group, they all have to approve the supplier and anyone can veto the supplier for you know, issues they may have. So that kind of creates, I think, a really healthy framework. So it's not totally a business-driven decision. It's a values-based decision mm -hmm. and a business decision. So I think that's a good, kind of a good framework that we use for suppliers. Um, there's always costs in developing new supply chains. Mm -hmm. And we, in most cases, just absorb that cost and hope that the rest of the industry, and this has happened in a number of cases, will adopt that uh, transformation in the supply chain. 
And, um, and so that's basically the, the model that we use. We don't really try not to pass the cost of our innovation um, over to the customer necessarily. Um, but we, we figure in the long term, people will be more attracted to that product and want to buy that product because it has an innovation mm -hmm. and um, it's better for the environment. And that's proved to be true. I mean, in the 13 year, this will be my 13th year this year, um, that I've been at Patagonia, that's proved to be true. Um, the, the more times we do things that are good for the planet, uh, the more money we make and the better business we have. We talk a lot in our strategy classes about trade-offs here. Um, so what would you say are some of the hardest trade-offs you think you faced while leaving Patagonia? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I would call this a trade-off. I mean, I think some of the hardest problems that we're facing have to do with um, these really entrenched systems. Like, like in 91, we, we switched to all organic cotton in our supply chain. And that was a big move because at the time that was 50% of our business. And, um, but our founders saw the devastation that chemical agriculture was doing to the planet. Um, he saw the dead zones, he saw the lack of wildlife, he saw the, the pollution in the rivers and, and he, he, you know, cotton is a very, um, it's, a, it's a highly toxic kind of crop. It uses um, like 10x the pesticides that other crops use. It's really bad. Conve chemical cotton. I don't call it conventional anymore. I call it chemical. Mm -hmm. chemical, chemical cotton, cotton uses, uses it's, it's really bad for the environment. And so when we made that switch, that, that was a really difficult switch. Now we're making now we're looking at you know the the issues that we know are there with climate change. You know we've got maybe all kinds of issues going on with topsoil erosion because of years of chemical agriculture in the U.S. Especially, I think we dump like 300 million pounds of pesticides on the soil every year. Um, that's what you're voting for when you buy a conventional cotton shirt. So. You know, you can vote with your dollars. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think looking ahead at the, you know, really decarbonizing the supply chain, I think that is a huge, huge issue that, that we're all facing, mm -hmm. is how to get to that goal to mitigate enough of the damage that's being done um, by, um, by the current um, level of carbon emissions that we have. And every company has to look at that. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not enough just to buy offsets. You have to really look at your supply chain and what you're, what you're doing and how your company operates. Are there any specific steps that you think other companies that aren't doing so well in that dimension should take to, to be able to do this better? Yeah, well, I think there's, um, there's a lot of, I think looking at the first movers and the people that are doing the work and they're doing it really thoroughly, I think that's a really important step. Um, I don't think governments, and I, I, I would say that in the first you know, five years or so of my time at Patagonia, I didn't do enough of like, really getting involved more in local and regional governments around policy. And um, I do th think that you can have a voice as a business to, to change that, to push for renewable energy in your communities, to push for um, renewable energy in your, with your supply chain partners or, or for fair trade, you know, for fair trade clothing. And, you know, there's a lot of ways that businesses can affect, you know, everyday people's lives in a positive way. And um, I think that that's, that's an important part of um, this challenge that we're all facing around will we have a planet that we can live on um, that, doesn't, that doesn't leave a lot of people behind, yeah. you know? Absolutely. So Patagonia has been recognized as one of the best places to work for. Um, from your perspective, what is it about the culture or the policies that you have in place that sort of has allowed it to receive this recognition and give it sort of an edge in this sense? Well, I think when you're working for something that's bigger than yourself, you know, yes, we are making incredible product, but we have a much bigger mission than just the product that we're making. Mm -hmm. And I think when you do that, you have a much more inspired workforce. You have people that show up to work today every day wanting to fight the good fight. They're excited about what they're doing. They want to jump on and do the work. And, that's, and I think that's a big part of what makes you know, the company successful. 
I think we grew out of a family business, and so we, we treat people like that. We treat people like, you know, like family. Um, and we don't, you know, we provide on-site child care. We've been providing on-site child care for 36 years. Uh, we have no issues with gender parity because of that. We have 50% women in management, 50% men in management. It's because we support working families and we support, we support you know, um, you know, women and their and children, and I think that, that that makes the company really successful, and it makes our, our employees really devoted to the company. Mm -hmm. Do you survey your employees periodically to sort of find out how happy they are, what types of policies they want, or is this just sort of a, a an output of the things that you're already doing? Naturally? Yeah. Well, we do a like a value survey every year to just sort of like take a pulse of you know, where people feel like we're doing well and where we're falling down and we might need, you know, to do more work. And, and I think that's a really useful tool. Yeah. Yeah. For, for other companies that maybe struggle with employee engagement more, what are some tips you would have for them? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you have to focus on the issues that we're really facing today. I mean, I, I think if you keep your company just sort of focused on making a profit, and not really caring about people or the planet, you're not gonna have a very successful company in the long run, I don't think. Um, I don't know. I yeah. mean, maybe there are companies like that that are super mm -hmm. successful, but they're probably not places that any of you would wanna work. But <laughs> maybe they are, I don't know. <laughs> no one here. <laughs> Um, so what do you think about, uh, for example, what we, we've heard from the business roundtable that companies yeah. are saying, publicly starting to say, you know, it's not all about shareholders. We care about these other stakeholders. Yeah. Do you believe those statements? Do you, are you a little cynical about them? What's your reaction to that? Yeah. Well, I think it's really good, you know, that, that they're saying it. I think it's, it's, it's now really what are they going to do to act on it? And I, I don't think we've really seen a lot of the action yet. Um, so until we see really specific action, then it's just, and we're, we're in a kind of a very urgent situation. So we shouldn't be, you know, we, sh we should be acting urgently mm -hmm. and, and we shouldn't be waiting for, you know, 20 years to implement some, you know, you know, goal setting objective or something. I mean, it's, you know, so that, that does concern me, you know, that there's been, you know, a decent amount of talk, but not a lot of action from that particular crowd. And I think, I think a lot of that has to do with the shareholder class, actually, yeah. um, because they're, you know, less, less convinced, maybe some of them, that, that we're even in a crisis, an existential, you know, threat to the planet, even though 99% of scientists, you know, agree that that's true. Um, yeah. Yeah. Am I depressing you, Vanessa? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. I'm not going to lie. No. <laughs> well, so um, what are, so if, let me ask you a couple of personal questions about sort of your experience. So, so, to, so we won't be quite as depressed. I'm just kidding. Um, what, what are some of the hardest decisions that you think you've sort of made when you come up on your career? If there's sort of one really tough decision that you look back and think that this was sort of a p pivotal mo moment for me yeah. personally. What might that be? Well, I was working in uh, Silicon Valley, and I was working in private equity. Um, I left my C CFO job. I was a mm -hmm. CFO of a public company. And, um, and I decided to just leave it all. And I was having too hard of a time doing work that wasn't aligned with my value system anymore. And when you're in um, when you're in private equity, especially, you know, the the point is is like to buy companies and make a lot of money. So a few shareholders make a bunch of money, and some of the people in the company make money sometimes. And I don't know. I just didn't want to participate in what I felt was not a very good system, because I I don't think it's a good system to make a bunch of people really rich, and you know. Yeah. Leave leave a lot of other people behind, um, and so I didn't want to participate in it anymore. And I stopped and I took a break. And a lot of people at that time said, "You are insane! You're taking a break in like the middle of the height of your career. What are you doing?" But I was really happy I did that because I got to sort of sit back and evaluate my life and evaluate what I wanted to do. And I had no idea how I was going to get from point A to point B, 
but it was a really good experience because I just, I would never have met Yvonne if it hadn't been for that, and I would never be CEO of Patagonia if it hadn't been for that. So I'm just really glad I took that time off and I looked within and, you know, took a break and, um, yeah. Do you have any advice or sort of process advice for, for others who might be considering sort of taking a, a pause or making a switch in their careers or otherwise evaluating? Yeah, well I was, I for me it was like, I, it was more of like a spiritual journey because I had been studying Buddhism for 20 years and been meditating and and I felt like, I don't know, I just wanted to have a, li a life that had more right work and right action in it. And um, and so I think I just went to that thing where I felt the most I were the where I was most interested in in um, understanding myself and um, what I could do for the world and and so I think you should go towards the things that you really love and you care about mm -hmm. and and the answer will be you know in there somewhere mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah that's helpful how about advice for new leaders or first time leaders or someone who kind of takes the reins of a company and wants to affect change or do things differently, what advice would you have for them? Well, I think you have to understand and respect the culture that's there because um, that's an important part of getting acquainted with any, um, with any company that you're working for. And then if you want to change that culture, um, you have to have the followership um, to change the culture. And I think you get the followership by giving some, giving people something bigger than themselves to go toward. Um, and making quarterly earnings numbers is not what's bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to have something that's much, much deeper and that resonates much more with what people really care about. Mm -hmm. would, it, would that advice change if you were thinking about sort of a, a student with a startup idea versus someone who's sort of taking on a new leading an existing company? Yeah, I mean, I think with startups, you have a much, you know, you have a, a much, uh, depending on who your investors are, if you have, you know, private equity investors that, you know, just want you to do it their way or whether you're really doing it your way. Um, I, would, I would say that if you have a startup, try and finance it yourself and not be beholden to, you know, other investors so that you can really have your what your vision of the company is and what your values are imprinted on the company. Um, that would be my advice mm -hmm. to startup. <laughs> mm -hmm. Somewhat related to that, so we, we uh, received some questions related to sort of innovation at Patagonia. Yeah. Um, you know, individuals who are starting their own ventures care a lot about sort of how do you create a culture of innovation, yeah. um, as do uh, other companies as well. Uh, so this is something that Patagonia is becoming more known for, in part mm -hmm. due to your leadership there. So how, how, how do you create a culture of innovation from within? Yeah. Well, innovation is important to any business, no matter what stage yeah. you are in. And, um, you know, what I've tried to do is, well, we set up an in-house venture fund really to fund new innovations. Because a lot of these environmental innovations that we're making, there aren't a lot of people funding them. There are a lot of people with great ideas on how to fix the world's problems, but you know, there's investors that are more interested in self-driving cars or going to Mars or whatever. <laughs> so they need, they need investors that really like care about their ideas and wanna bring them forward. So I think creating just a culture where we welcome all that and we welcome those, those people that wanna make those changes. And then, um, and then in the work that we do building product, um, and we're one of the few apparel companies that really have a full in-house design team and I think that really helps with innovation because our designers are very innovative. They're always innovating to solve problems. They're innovating to solve environmental problems. They're innovating to solve um, you know, problems that people that do our sports have. And so I think it just creates this culture that feeds on itself that innovation is good. You shouldn't be afraid of it. You should always embrace it. And that you're gonna fail a bunch of times when you innovate and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So that's it's sort of the way that we've We've done it, and I feel like we've we've had a much more sort of innovative, you know, process in the last, you know, the last five years. I would say, mm -hmm. um, we've got all the right people on board working on it. And when you recruit those those people, what what do you look for? How do you come up with that combination in your design yeah. team? Well, they, I mean, they come from all different um, areas. You know, they don't have to be necessarily apparel designers. 
They can come from innovation labs and you know car designers or you know all, all kinds of different fields because mm -hmm. um, it takes all different kinds of engineers and scientists to solve the problems that we're working on. So um, yeah, so we recruit from a really wide uh, range of industries and not just sort of our own wheelhouse industry. And I think that's helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you think about recruiting more broadly, so you were telling us earlier about some of the staggering statistics of the number <laughs> of people who apply to each of your positions. Yeah. What, what do you think about when you're recruiting? Well, I, I think we, we were talking about this before, but, but you know, when, um, when we recruit for a job, if, if the person really doesn't share our values around environmental protection and conservation, it usually becomes known really fast. Like, they usually end up leaving the company quickly. Um, so I do think that if they share that value with us, then it, it works out really well. Mm -hmm. And we get about 9,000 applicants for each job. Um, and Not yeah. to dissuade anyone from yeah. applying. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it, it's yeah, but I, I think the applicants are, I, I think what, what you should take from that is not just that we get 9,000 applicants, but that, but that when you have a mission that, that really inspires people, then you will get 9,000 applicants for jobs, you know? You will get the best people who really care about solving these issues because they're, they're, they're focused on working for those companies that they think are doing real, real good in the world. Mm -hmm. So there's a question about um, sort of competition that Patagonia is starting to face. Um, the, the note was sort of that there, uh, there was a, a moment in time when Patagonia was maybe the only one trying to do what it's doing, and now it's starting to face competition from other retailers that are also seeing sort of the value in being sustainable and sort of providing that which customers sort of value as well. Um, so how do you think potentially this increase in competition, as others start to do more of, of what Patagonia is doing, how do you think the company will, will sort of change or evolve in response to that competition? Well, I think, you know, we've always, the, the industry, the outdoor industry itself has been around about 50 years, so it's a pretty mature mm -hmm. industry. And what we're seeing is a lot of other um, more lifestyle brands kind of getting yeah. into the space. But I think to the extent that we influence those brands and um, competitors to, to ad uh, adapt and adopt more um, environmental fabrics and processes, I think that's a really good thing. Mm -hmm. And it's always been a part of our company. You know, we've always, we've always given away our IP to the industry at large because we want more people to adopt it and we want more people to use it. Um, we often are the first to come out with something because we'll invest in the innovation. And, um, but that's essentially how we think about it. I mean, I don't think of it as a bad thing. I think this is the good part of capitalism to me. Competition, mm -hmm. innovation, you know, the best ideas win, the best products win. That's the good part of capitalism. Mm -hmm. You know, a bunch of money going to one company that hoards it, not the good part. A bunch of money going to one company that never pays taxes, not the good part, right? <laughs> there are like, you know, a bunch of money going to just a few investors, uh, yeah, not the good part. I mean, you know, these are things that I think, you know, can be, can be evolved, that, are, that will have to evolve in order for us to have, you know, a good life and make a better world and have a planet that we all can live on. Mm -hmm. So Patagonia has started to take um, public stands on political issues. Um, and there are other companies that are starting to do some more of this as well. Mm -hmm. How do you decide which issues to, to take a stance on versus stay silent on? Um, and, and what's your experience been in, in what could potentially be sort of contentious types of, of <laughs> statements? Just mildly contentious. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, it's really pretty clear. I mean, like we've been giving to um, grassroots um, environmental activists for years. Mm -hmm. So we've always been about protection of wild places um, and protections of air, water, soil. Um, and um, so that's, that's kind of in our DNA and those are the kinds of issues that we take up. Um, you know, it's become more political because for some reason, I don't know, people don't believe in science anymore in America, but um, it's, it's, it's become political because the political people have made it political, but it's not really political. I mean, the conservation movement has always been very much a bipartisan movement. 
Um, when the Trump administration signed away three million acres of you know, national monuments in a stroke of a pen, we sued the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. But that's because that's our value as a company. You know, we're not, we're not gonna sit by and let that go and sit silently and say nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, th then we don't, we, we don't really stand for what we stand for. You know, was that contentious? Yeah. <laughs> Suing I mean, the Trump administration? Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, and it's been, yeah, then and, and we've we've sued them on the Endangered Species Act, and we've we've you know we've we've we keep going down the road, right? Because we're protecting these places that we love and we care for. And are there other companies that um, that are sort of your part have become your partners in these types of initiatives? Yeah, I mean the whole outdoor industry, you know, when when the Utah protections, those are the national monuments we're talking about, Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante in, in Utah that uh, three different presidents had a hand in creating. Um, when that happened, we went to the governor of Utah as, as a group, um, the, out, the Outdoor Industry Association, um, and we talked to him about it and said, we, you know, we think this is really, really bad. We don't support it. At the time we were doing our annual trade show in Utah in Salt Lake City, we had done it for years there. And we said, if you don't do something about it, we're going to pull out of the show. Mm -hmm. And we did, because he did nothing about it. So I do think businesses can come together, and I think we should do it more. I think we should do it more urgently now, because of everything that's going on in the world. I think we need to, we need to come together and be more forceful towards you know, governments on policy and you know, that, that's bad for the, you know, bad for the planet. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that the purpose of doing that was just to open up, you know, oil and drill, you know, mining mm -hmm. resources. Yeah. And those are your public lands. That was your three million acres. You know, you're public landowners, mm -hmm. all of you. And they want to take it away. Mm -hmm. You got to fight for it. <laughs> Do you think it would be harder to take those types of stances as a... Um, as a publicly traded company, so for for leaders who who share the sentiment yeah. um, and want to do something similar, but feel they're maybe a little bit more constrained by not being sort of a privately held company, what what yeah. are your thoughts about that? And advice maybe for those leaders? Well, I have a lot of friends who are CEOs of public mm -hmm. companies, and the problem is not them; it's their shareholders. It keeps going back to their shareholders. Mm -hmm. The very few elite investor class yeah. that control what they do and what they say. And that's the problem. Is there anything that they, that they can do or might try to influence them? Yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've, I think there's been some progress in like, you know, getting rid of this quarterly, weird quarterly earnings drive, you know, that that's been around you know, for a long time. I mean, what is the point of reporting earnings every quarter? Why is that a good thing? Nothing important happens in a quarter. Yeah. You know, yeah. think about your own life. I mean, what happens in a quarter, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it gets you, it, it's a really, it's disastrous for the planet, I think. You know, this, this like short-termism. Mm -hmm. um, Patagonia has been around 46 years. It's the healthiest it's ever been right now. It's really a healthy company. Um, and, you know, I just, I think that the public markets need to change and they need to evolve. And I, I do think that CEOs of public companies, they really understand it. I think it's changing the minds of that investor class. Mm -hmm. And I'm not exactly sure the best way to do that, although I think that, you know, I think that, that you know, Larry Fink coming out and, you know, making those statements is, is it, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a step. Mm -hmm. Don't know if it's a big enough step, but mm -hmm. it's a step. So you mentioned, you know, let, let's move away from the quarterly reviews. Yeah. How, what's the time frame that you think about at P P Patagonia in terms of sort of setting goals and m sort of marking well, Yeah, well, goals? we plan in basically five, 10, and 20 year cycles, essentially. That's the way we're looking at mm -hmm. the business. You really can't plan well beyond mm -hmm. Five years, but we were always kind of looking at at least a ten-year increment. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we, we take on big changes because we know, well, in the long run, they'll, they'll pay off. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, speaking of 10 years, you know, what, what is your vision for Patagonia in 10 years? What do you hope that it will be 10 years from now? Well, I hope Patagonia is a lot around a lot longer than 10 years. So the things that I'm really thinking about in the next 10 years are getting really being an example for becoming carbon, carbon neutral and showing that you can do that all the way through your supply chain, you know, in a real way, not just, you know, buying offsets that may or may not be, you know, real. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, and, and, you know, just to continue really to, to grow um, our food business, which is really based on um, regenerative organic principles. So there's a lot going on with farming, a lot of innovation going on with small farms where they're using uh, regenerative practices that are building topsoil. Because we've had a lot of topsoil loss in the last 50 years. And there are some scientists that say we only have 50 years, 50 more harvests in the US in terms of the quality of our topsoil. But think about it, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds of chemicals and synthetic fertilizers poured on the soil. I mean, the soil is, li is a living thing. And um, it's, you know, you look at the cancer rates and, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot in the soil and the decline of pollinators, all of these issues. So there's a, there's a, a lot of really exciting innovation in farming where they're using these regenerative practices that look more like nature mm -hmm. in the way that they work. They don't till the soil, they cover crop, they do some really interesting things and it's bringing back pollinators, it's creating healthy, more nutritious food. And so in the last few years, we've been working on this regenerative organic certification for food. And you'll actually start seeing it on label um, with, with some other companies as well as ours that came together in a coalition to build the certification um, because they're worried about the same things that we are. But we're up against chemical agriculture and the big, you know, the big ag guys. And, you know, we're doing our best to fight the good fight. So that's, that's what I'm best. working on. <laughs> You'll be a little bit busy, but we're, yeah, excited. Yeah. we're excited for it. That's fantastic. Um, so at this point, we will open it up to questions from the audience. Hi, thanks so much for uh, coming out and speaking yeah. to us, and congratulations. Um, I was just wondering, you know, there's a population of customers who likely share Patagonia's values but might not have the funds to purchase Patagonia's products. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if, like, the price point that Patagonia is mostly at is necessary to sustain Patagonia's mission, or if you see yourselves offering sort of a broader array of price points down the line? Yeah. Well, we are essentially competitive with the other companies that are in our, in our realm, but, but one of the ways that we've been uh, working to get, um, well, a lot of younger people are coming to the brand through our activism. They don't need to buy anything from us. They can just go to patagoniaactionworks.com and they can learn about how to get invo involved in their environmental in, in our environmental mission, which is cool. Um, but we're also doing a program called Warnware where you can buy you know, slightly used stuff and much, at much lower price point. And, um, and that's all part of our repair program. So we've been, we've been doing that more forward facing for the last um, about five years and it's, it's growing every day. And I think the secondary market is gonna be really important because we'll ultimately run out of resources you know, there won't be a lot of virgin materials left, I think, you know, as if we keep growing at the rates that we're growing uh, and people keep using apparel in the way they're using it, so. Hi, Rose, thank you so much for being here. It's really exciting to see you speak. Um, really fascinated by Patagonia provisions and regenerative agriculture, and I'm curious, I kind of have a few sub-questions. Um, <laughs> First of all, um, do you find it challenging to find suppliers that uh, can be approved for to supply Patagonia? And um, do you see more and more suppliers becoming certified to be able to supply Patagonia? And also, um, what do you envision as the future of Patagonia provisions? Do you think this is a company that can scale to be something big, or do you more envision it to be something more small and niche? Mm -hmm. And then also, um, <laughs> this is my chance. Um, during the Super Bowl, which I didn't watch, but I did see the commercial from a beer company that 
uh, with the, yeah. that was supporting ag re regenerative agriculture, saying that if you buy a six pack of their beer, I think it was maybe Michelob or something, mm -hmm. that uh, want six by six feet are going to be converted to regenerative agriculture land. Mm -hmm. And what is your opinion on that? Is this something exciting? Do you think that they're spreading the word, or is it is it a bit cheap? Like, is it authentic? Mm -hmm. All of these things together. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll see if I can remember all those those questions. But but yeah, on on regenerative organic, um, we we did a pilot of about thirty companies, or and and so those companies helped us to build the standard, which is really great. And then there are certifications that come out of that. I think that um, you know there's a lot of people that are doing doing um, regenerative agriculture in the right way already. It's just highlighting them and building their supply chain. So that's basically what we're, we're doing with that. That's hard work, because building supply chains is hard. <laughs> if you've done it for a small company or big company, you know it's hard. Um, but but that's, that's sort of what we're focused on there. Um, in terms of like the, you know, the beer commercial or whatever, I, I think it's good. I think it's good to raise people's awareness that we need to convert to organic agriculture. I mean, we really do if we want to, it's, that's, that's a really important part of saving the planet. And we need to get out of this industrialized model of agriculture. This is really hurting the planet. It's really hurting pollinators. You know, when the pollinators are gone, we're gone. I mean, and they are in, they're in bad shape right now. So the, the reality is that's the most, you know, it's the most important consequential thing you can do is, is you know, buy less but buy better quality. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard because our government is subsidizing a lot of bad agriculture right now. And that's another thing we have to fight for, and we need to fight for better policies around that. So, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Rose. My name is Peggy. I'm an alum. Um, spent quite a number of years in corporate. No longer there. I'm a yoga instructor now. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> But um, in terms of uh, diversity, in diversity of thought, mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that when I was in corporate, group think was not a good thing. When everyone's thinking the same, feeling the same, yeah. singing Kumbaya, you really didn't get good innovation or good growth. So that's my question regarding your company as you're growing, whether you're bringing in, I hear a lot of young talent. Not all of us are young, <laughs> but we still have talent, mm -hmm. as well as just maybe individuals who can come in and challenge and not have activism as part of their DNA. So yeah. I'm just curious in terms of how you address the diversity of thought yeah. within your company. Yeah, well, the, the outdoor industry is kind of a bubble. You know, it always has been kind of a bubble, which I don't think has been a good thing. You know, for, for exactly the thing that you're talking about, you know, is there enough diversity of thought? And, and so what we've tried to do is when we look at recruiting, uh, instead of recruiting in the same places that we've always recruited, we're recruiting in different places um, and we're bringing different groups of people together. And I think that that's been helpful, but I don't think we're far, I, I think we, this is something we could do much, much better job at. Part of the issue that we have is that people come and they never leave. So <laughs> we, <laughs> we don't have a lot of turnover. Like our turnover is insanely small. And even for a retailer, which usually you have seasonal, you know, customer service reps and seasonal retail retail folks, but that's that's not necessarily the case even in our retail stores. Um, so yeah, so that 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 is a problem I think for us a little bit and it's it's definitely something we could we could work on more, but it's it's somewhat driven by the fact that we we have very low turnover. So it takes longer to make the change. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. I wanted to know if you had any insight, tidbits, or stories on how Patagonia became the brand of choice for business schools, bold bracket banks, private equity firms, VC <laughs> funds, basically any company in midtown Manhattan. And I know there's been a lot of recent controversy about that, but I was more curious, how did that all happen? Like, do, do we know? I don't know. I mean, we don't really know. I, I, I mean, it typically tends to be in places where it's colder, you know, like New York and San Francisco and, you know, the other parts of the East Coast. I mean, I don't know. It, I, can't, I can't really give you an answer to that. I don't know how it's become that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> 
take a question over here. Sorry, I'm doing what I do in class and trying to get questions Everybody. from everywhere. And as a result, I'm sending the microphones all over the place. The first part is, did you, have you thought about something like action works, but for companies? So a place where companies can collaborate and mm -hmm. not just in individuals. And the second one is, what do you think, like you have a passion about environment and I, I guess you invested a lot of time in that, but not all companies have the time or resources. What is the right distribution of attention? Should they invest themselves or invest in external, com in maybe in start in external organizations that would invest in, in this? So should they do what they do best and then put the money yeah. or do it themselves? Um, well, we, we do a lot of convening of companies to the first part of your question where we convene, um, we convene our peers, we convene people from other, um, other types of industry to come together and talk about these issues because most people are working, most, most um, businesses are working towards the climate goals, um, not because, um, not always for altruistic reasons, but because they recognize that it's having a serious impact on their business and will have a serious impact on their business, so they have to pay attention to it. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I can't say whether what company should have what percentage of their, you know, um, you know, their, their attention towards environmental issues. I can only say that a lot of companies are looking at this carbon neutrality goal and recognizing that they need to get there, you know. Thank you. Um, you joined Patagonia as a CFO in 2008 and then made the transition to CEO. So I was wondering what new skills or approaches you felt like you had to learn um, at that time during the transition and today, um, what skills you're working on currently? <laughs> well, I think the biggest thing, the biggest transition from becoming CFO to CEO is that you really realize that everyone is literally watching everything that you're doing and saying. <laughs> And that's really different, you know, than just like in your day-to-day -day work life. You know, you just, you, people put a lot more emphasis on the things that you do and the things that you say. And you probably guessed from the last hour or so that I, I'm a pretty, you know, candid person. And I say things pretty straight up. And, you know, sometimes that can be sort of shocking to people. <laughs> so I had to learn to kind of, you know, be more aware of that, I think. I don't really temper it, but I'm just aware of it. Um, you know, I think what I'm, <laughs> I think what I'm working on more now is is being, um, see, you know, really working on how to influence uh, policy more because I think that um, we need to businesses need to influence government more when government doesn't step up, and so that, where there needs to be better ways to do that. Thanks a lot. Do you um, do you partner with NGOs like Greenpeace? And to, to what you just said in terms of policy, would you consider becoming Secretary of the Environment in a future <laughs> Bernie Sanders or whoever administration? <laughs> um, we do, we, we partner with NGOs all the time because we fund NGOs through this 1% program that we have where we give 1% of sales to grassroots environmental organizations. So we're really connected with a lot of environmental NGOs and we really fight the fight alongside them. Um, in terms of politics, I don't, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know if that's something I would ever want to do. <laughs> that's what all politicians say, by the way. <laughs> no, I, I mean that. <laughs> Question over here. Hi, my name is James. I'm a new incoming J-Term student, so I just started school. And one of the big things is I'm, I'm really inspired by Patagonia so much that this was the last big ticket item that I bought before coming. <laughs> How about companies that have inherently different business models that, uh, for instance, I was in the military, I did private equity in oil and gas, I'm now in pharmaceuticals that do not necessarily have a product that's socially conscious. If you were a leader in those situations, how do you make the first step towards aligning vision to profits and maybe making the argument that maybe profits are not necessarily the only thing at stake, but perhaps a bigger picture, something bigger mm -hmm. than yourself. Yeah, I mean, um, I can't imagine leading a pharmaceutical company. Um, <laughs> it's, I, I can't, I mean, I, I kind of can't, I can't put myself in that place, but um, I can say that I, I think that um, most organizations, you know, you kind of have to find the heart of the organization and usually there's a heart somewhere, even though it might be beating faintly, it's there. 
and and that's kind of where to where to go and where to focus on. You know, that's that's what I think. But uh, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to imagine that <laughs> working in that environment again. Um, Um, this is building somewhat off of his question. Um, Delta recently announced that they would be uh, driving towards carbon neutral in the next 10 years, mostly using offsets, I would mm -hmm. imagine. Um, and you talked a little bit about how offsets are not the most effective way to go about. Mm -hmm. But what does an inherently high carbon emission business do uh, to drive towards that goal? Mm -hmm. Electric And planes. what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's innovation, actually, that drives towards those goals. Um, yeah, I don't know much about the Delta program and what they're doing, so I can't speak intelligently to that. <laughs> Wanted to make sure it was on. Um, uh, Rose, again, thank you for coming this evening. I'd like to understand, so as you say, so having worked in the supply chain business for a number of years, I know that it's very data intensive and there's a lot of different pieces in it. Can you go into some detail around how you apply data and data-driven decision-making to the more ESG side of your business yeah. and how that drives impact both for you and helps you drive impact in others? Because while grassroots is, is very good, sometimes it needs to be more than grassroots to really enact a lot of change. Yeah. Um we use data in a lot of ways. You know, we, we do really thorough um, life cycle analysis of our products. Um, we ma match that with our growth and um, our projected growth. And we look at our worst offenders in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions and we go after that, you know, kind of using the Pareto principle. And um, that's the way that we, we sort of attack the supply chain issues. Um, and then, as you probably know, if you've worked in the field, you know, you're, it's, it's each individual supplier. And since we tend to have longer term relationships with our suppliers, it's a little bit easier to get, you know, to make change happen. So, um, you know, right now we're working, you know, for the carbon neutral goals, we're working on convening larger groups of um, uh, businesses that use similar factories to us to work together towards the goal and to getting to, um, you know, reduction or complete elimination of, um, of uh, carbon in the supply chain. But it's, it's heavy lifting for sure. And um, we have a lot of scientists, chemical engineers, you know, other engineers that work on, um, uh, environmental engineers that work on, you know, getting the data for us to make those decisions and, um, and then getting that to scale. And we're happy to do that work and have other companies adopt it, you know, because that's really how we'll get to scale. So, yeah. Um, well, congratulations on your award and thank, thank you. you for being here. Um, I first have a comment and then a question. I just wanna say thank you so much for 1% in ActionWorks. It's been an amazing program for a consumer like me to help bridge the gap between my interests and my work. Awesome. So thank you. Uh, and then second, the question is, um, I'm assuming at some point in Patagonia's history, you have experienced a waning in customer engagement or you have seen uh, some hard times with just loyal consumer behavior. So um, did you rely exclusively on your story and your values to help capture customers in market share or how, what, how did you course correct in tough times? Honestly, we haven't really had we, the toughest time that I was when I first came into the company in 08, right at the financial crash, mm -hmm. and there was a lot going on. You know, remember like banks were shutting down, and it was just a crazy time. Um, and we we had a um, you know we kind of went on an austerity program and and managed the company that way. Um, but then we ended up having actually an okay year. Um, but we asked our employees, if, like we told them we weren't going to be able to give them raises that year, and we 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 really just talked honestly about what the situation was. And then when it turned out to be a better year than we thought, we retroactively gave them their pay raises back, and we we did we did the right thing. But that was the worst year, the the worst um, economic year that that we had was that first year I came in as CFO uh, in the financial crisis. And since then, it's really been I haven't had to deal with with that issue that you're talking about. We've been more, you know, building our customer 
base and um, building more engagement. And I think a lot of it has to do with the work that we're doing and, um, and the stands that we're taking for the environment, honestly. I mean, um, there were a lot of people saying that we were going to lose a bunch of customers by you know, um, suing the, the administration, and that was just the exact opposite. We, we got more customers, and we got more revenue. So, and, and they've stayed with us, and they're good customers. Question in the very back. There seems to be some irony that uh, Patagonia, which was founded by a dirtbag rock climber, pretty far from the world of business schools, is now giving a lecture at a business school. So I'd love to hear your opinion on like business schools today. Uh, maybe Columbia specifically, or uh, generally, like, are they doing a good job? Are they necessary? Uh, and what could they do better to prepare future leaders? Oh, God, I don't feel like an expert in business schools at all. I don't know that I could, could say that. Um, I think I'll, I can t share an observation that I have about speaking at some business schools and talking to a lot of students and student groups. And that's that, um, that they want to do something good for the world, that they want their life to have more meaning than just you know, making a quarterly profit. And that if you could harness that in a productive way, then I think we could solve most of the big intractable problems that we're looking at today. And I, I wish that more leaders would recognize that and, um, and be inspired by that. Um, but yeah, I can't, I can't critique business schools because I barely graduated with an MBA, so. Um, I was wondering, are there companies that you like working with on your initiatives, like the policy initiatives for sustainability and all that? And are there maybe other companies that you would like to reach out to to work together to further your objectives? Uh, yeah, we work with a lot of different companies from all over um, the spectrum. Um, you know, I, I don't, um, you know, there are, Nike, there, there are businesses like Nike that have so much scale that if we got them to adopt some changes that that could be very positive. So I've sort of maybe set my sights on, you know, some of the bigger apparel companies to go, to go after, but again, you know, they're public companies and they're driven by the public markets in a lot of ways and public shareholders. So it makes it harder. Um, yeah, that's what I would say about that. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Um, speaking of public companies, I was curious if you had any opinions on proxy voting and what big, um, banks and asset managers can do to vote proxy shares in terms of uh, better business values? Well, I, I, guess, I guess I would say about that that um, I think that, that there's a tremendous amount of, of um, value in like, you know, understanding how the current environmental issues are affecting business. And, and I don't think there's enough talk about that because the long range effect of some of the things that we're experiencing in the climate crisis, billions of dollars in damages, failures of insurance companies, I mean, these things are real tangible things that we're not talking enough about. So, um, yeah, I don't know about, you know, it, I feel like at that level, that, that's probably not where the change is going to happen, but maybe it could be, I don't know. Uh, thank you again for coming by. Uh, my question is specific to how Patagonia has changed under your leadership. Um, what would you think is your imprint on the culture of the company? Like, how is it different, if at all? And then on the values piece, I'm sure it overlaps significantly with what it was before, but has there been an evolution of those values or in addition to those values based off of your values specifically? Um, I hope the imprint that I leave on the company is is that we we engage more in our activism as a corporation, and and we we use the corporation as an activist and a catalyst for change in a, in a more in a deeper way than we were doing before by just funding NGOs, and that we also that we invited our customers to do the same um, by setting up the Patagonia Action Works platform. Um, 
Yeah, and the second part of your question was, well, that was more like how the culture of the company has changed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think that activism has is definitely more. I think Vaughn was um, funding NGOs and and using the company's voice for sure. But I think we've been a lot more more active in our sort of um, our overall activism around climate. Yeah. Hi. I'm curious to get your thoughts on quality, um, specifically whether you see a trend towards greater appreciation for quality, and just generally whether Patagonia is in a position to seize on that because of or in spite of um, your practices. Yeah, I mean, qual quality has always been really foundational to the company. We go through this um, intense process of scoring every product by all these different dimensions, including quality. It's really important to stay on top of that. And I think in, in you know, what you've seen in the last you know, few years with the maker movement and people really um, caring about things that you make with your hands and that you, that you make of high quality, I think that's, you know, we've, we've always sort of worked with, along that practice and we always will, I think. And so I think, yeah, it's good, it's good for us when people focus more on quality. Look, the, the, the single best thing that you can do for the environment is to buy, keep your stuff in use longer. It's to buy good quality stuff that lasts a long time. Mm -hmm. And that's why we repair everything we make. Uh, you know, if you need it repaired or if it's beyond repair, we'll take it back and figure out how to recycle it. Um, and you should, you know, you should demand that of everyone that you buy product from. Because then you know that they're taking responsibility for, for their product from end to end. So. Hi, Rose. Thank you. I'm curious about what you think about the either B Corp certification or the Benefit Corp legal status. Is that yeah. going to move the needle or is it no, too, I think too it, I think it's a good process. I think it's, it's still a little un, untested, but it's a really good process. I mean, there's 50,000 companies that have taken the B Impact assessment. Um, there's, I, I sat on the advisory board for Danone, which is the largest um, U.S. public company that has, um, that has been certified. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really good because it, it's a third-party certification and it scores you based on dimensions that really show that you're serving you know, multiple stakeholders. So I think it's a good start because um, it's a really strong community of companies right now and I hope it just continues to grow. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you again for being here. So uh, I think a common narrative among college and business school students is the idea that you'll go and do something and gain experience and then later put that experience to work for good. And you sort of share that your career has in some ways followed that arc. If you had it to do over again, would you get the experience that you got working in uh, a public company and then find your way to Patagonia or would you do things differently earlier on? I with think, the knowledge you have now. I think I would, would do things differently earlier on. Yeah, I think I wouldn't have stayed in some of the places that I stayed. And I think I, I would have trusted more my inner voice. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'd just like to say thank you so much. Thank you for all the questions. It was awesome. <laughs>